Hello, and welcome to this recorded presentation on Chasing Opportunities with the Washington State Energy Code. I'm your narrator, Dan Wildenhouse, with the Better Built Northwest program. In these presentations, we'll dive into some techniques for meeting and exceeding code with various options from Table 406.3 in the 2018 Washington State Energy Code. This session will focus on getting the heating and cooling systems and ductwork inside the condition volume of the home. Other modules will include building tight and ventilating right, as well as advanced wall designs. So with that, let's go. Okay, so let's look at the specifics. We're gonna start with where the ducts live, right? No, I, I don't mean those kind of ducts, right? Um, what kind of ducts do I mean? Yes, that's right. We mean the ductwork that is most commonly in the Pacific Northwest and in Washington State, put in the garage, put in the attic, and put in the crawl space underneath the home. Um, if we think about this, um, ducts lose heat whenever they get hot or they gain heat whenever they get cold. So they get hot when we're in our heating season. Um, they get cold when we're running cooling through them. Um, we gain or lose heat in three different ways. Conductive losses. This is where we lose or gain heat through contact with the building structure, such as framing. There are convective losses. This is loss through air movement, and that would be typically things like duct leakage. And again, duct leakage in an attic, a crawl space, or a garage is very different than in between floors, for instance. And then finally, radiant losses. So this is the duct work um, itself gets hot or gets cold and then re-radiates to cooler or hotter surfaces around it. Um, so each of these poses a challenge. But let's think about this. Let's, we'll take the heating season to be specific. Heating ducts typically carry 105 to 125 degree Fahrenheit air when we're in heating mode. And yet our codes have only required R8 insulation around them. In context, the walls of our building must be insulated to at least R21. And isn't it odd that we have an R21 for a wall when we keep our homes at 70 degrees inside and only R8 in our, over our ducts, which on average are 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Moving the ducts to inside the envelope or to under the insulation at the very least is a great way to think about where should the insulation really be. Let's keep the hottest stuff hot and the coldest stuff cold. That's what this section is really all about. Now, I'm not going to go really deep into this. I just wanted to have one slide on this to recognize that simply not having ductwork is actually an option. Um, you don't get um, the Table 406.3 credits for HVAC distribution by having a ductless heat pump or a radiant system, but option 3.4 gives you a credit and a half, and that's for having an HSPF 10 ductless heat pump in the main body of the home. And option 3.6 gives you two full credits by having um, both an HSPF uh, 10 for the entire house, not just in the main body, and very limited alternative additional heating, such as a bathroom heater or something of that nature. So this is an option. Again, this isn't going to give you table 406.3 credit for distribution, but what you will get is in some enhanced credits in the equipment selection. So it all comes out fairly similarly. So no ducts is an option, but we're gonna spend the rest of the time talking about ducted homes. The first thought that most builders that we talk to have is that deeply buried ducts sounds like a reasonable approach. Um, it gives you a half of a credit um, out of the six that you're gonna need for a medium sized home. And if you're the kind of person that learns well from reading specifications, et cetera, both the IECC and the Washington State Energy Code and the Building America Solution Center all provide the good details and all the specifics. The Building America Solution Center also describes deeply buried ducts um, with images and diagrams, as well as some best practices to make this work for you. So if you are considering deeply buried as an approach, think of the IECC, um, the 2018 Washington State Energy Code, and the Building America Solution Center as some really good resources to help get you there. Now, this does not mean that you have to move away from bats entirely in your attic when you see these images. Um, you effectively, though, will need to do blown-in insulation around the ductwork to get over it. So 
while it doesn't mandate that you switch away from bats, if we think about this realistically, you're probably going to be moving towards blow-in insulation when we're doing deeply buried ducts. Um, we also want to think some specifics on this. The supply and return ducts um, will still need to be insulated to R8. That doesn't change just because you're burying them. Um, then at all points along each duct, um, we have to add both the R value of the insulation around it as well as the insulation on the duct. So R8 on the duct and a minimum of R19 of insulation on top of the duct. That really is what we mean by deeply buried. So that gives us something like an equivalent R25 around a duct, which is much better when we just talked about, you know, that heat loss um, and heat gain problem with much warmer air in the, our ductwork. Having something closer to R25 protecting the ductwork versus R8 is a pretty darn big efficiency gain. So deeply buried ducts, this is the very basics of it. Um, we're going to keep going and, and talk even more about this um, as we go through it. So as I mentioned, the deeply buried ducts does sound pretty attractive, um, but there are some things that you really need to know uh, when you think about this. Um, the first part is that you are allowed to have a small amount of duct work outside of the uh, insulation. So for instance, we allow 10 linear feet of return duct to not be deeply buried. And then, you know, when you have a, say, a furnace or an air source heat pump on the second story of a home, effectively in a closet, you don't want to have a return grill immediately going into the home, potentially, uh, because that could be a noise complaint. So this allows you to run a 10-foot flex duct, you know, kind of in an arch up through the attic to really dampen down the sound. So that is something that's allowable. But there are some other caveats. So just because you did deeply buried ducts, guess what? You still need to do duct leakage testing and duct tightness. Um, a standard for any duct work in a, in a home that where the duct work is outside of the thermal envelope is four CFM per hundred square feet of conditioned floor area. That's about four basketballs worth of air. Every minute is allowed to leak out at a specified pressure for every hundred square feet of home that you have. If you go deeply buried ducts, you still need to test, and now you're limited to three basketballs worth of air per 100 square feet of conditioned floor area. So your ductwork needs to be at least 25 to 33% tighter just to do deeply buried ducts. The next one, and this is a big one, if you're moving to deeply buried ducts, you still need to get the air handler, again, whether it's a furnace or a heat pump, needs to be located within the conditioned space. And we recognize this can be a challenge, but this is our new baseline. Um, deeply buried or ducts inside, you're going to need to get that air handler inside the condition space. We're going to jump into that next and, and really look at that. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about moving that mechanical system inside the thermal envelope. Um, this could involve designing a space, maybe converting a closet on the second floor, or getting creative with some other design options. The biggest benefit to this strategy involves making the smallest amount of changes to the thermal envelope, as well as providing, hopefully, easy access for the homeowners and technicians in the future to access that furnace. In this variation, we notice that the return duct you can see is still in the attic. You can see it looks like it's about five or six feet down the hallway from where the furnace is and is a probably about a 10 foot loop of duct. And so that qualifies as that exception that I mentioned, and yet is still going to make sure that we don't have too much sound transfer. So the other option here is to extend the thermal envelope around the existing system location. So this can work, but for the instances such as this, where it's located, let's say in the garage, we have to think about the wall between our air handler closet um, and the garage. It's going to need to be insulated while the wall between the closet and the house is not, right? So we wanna move the insulation around to keep that closet thermally disconnected from that colder garage. Now, you'll need to pay special attention and look at the fire and residential codes and how jurisdictions are interpreting them. You may need to do double drywall or something between this uh, air handler closet and the main body of the home for flame and smoke spread um, reasons. 
So I don't want to dismiss that, that that is challenging. Um, there are some other considerations here. How big of a space are you willing to build around it? In a garage, we're talking about potentially giving up garage space. Um, and we know that garage space is highly valuable. But what about if our furnace is in an attic or typically underneath the home in a crawl space? Those present some unique challenges and we may be faced with redesigning where we can put our air handlers. Um, if it's in the attic, yes, you could make your attic a conditioned space. That is allowable by our code. Um, but it also brings up new challenges. Um, if you insulate the underside of a roof and don't vent it, uh, what are you allowed to do in terms of roofing materials and how do you make sure you don't get into a situation where you avoid a warranty? So you really have to learn those some of those specifics um, in order to make sure you do it right. When it comes to crawl spaces under homes, from a statewide perspective, our state code does not encourage or in many cases allow conditioned crawl spaces, but there may be some jurisdictions that are willing to consider that. So if so, you're just gonna have to think this all the way through, where did I put my insulation? Is my air handler um, and my furnace or heat pump inside that thermal boundary? That is the goal. Now we promise we're not trying to make this sound harder than it is. We just wanna be very realistic. So let's be realistic. Let's take a look at what these deeply buried ducts look like in, in, out in the wild, so to speak. So the first thing we want to do is we want to get our ductwork as close to the ceiling level um, or in a garage ceiling, the underfloor of the bonus room or the bedroom, for instance. This will ensure that there's always as much or more insulation between the ducts in the attic or the garage as there is between the duct and the air barrier. This can have the added benefit of ensuring that the ducts are run as straight as possible with the fewest kinks and turns, and that can improve airflow, particularly if you add flex duct. Second, it's really important to have depth markers included every 10 feet, both to ensure that we have the proper amount of insulation installed on top of the ductwork, but also so that future contractors or homeowners don't kick, trip over, or accidentally uncover the buried ducts while putting away their holiday decorations or chasing down that rogue squirrel that somehow got in the attic. So deeply buried ducts are very doable with some attention to detail. So I mentioned earlier, um, thinking about the, the business case for how we look at this, if we're already talking about having to move our air handler inside the thermal boundary and it burying our ductwork and making sure that it's really tight, we may want to consider fully moving the ducts inside of the envelope. This gives us a full credit as opposed to a half credit with the Washington State Energy Code. And there are a lot of ways to do this. We can move ductwork um, in between floors and in interior walls. We can build dropped soffits where we lower a portion of our ceiling. Now with nine, 10, 11, and 12 foot um, walls and ceilings being much more common than they were 20 years ago, a dropped soffit in a hallway dropping down to eight and a half feet may be a realistic way to still maintain a good visual through the home, but yet provide a pathway for ductwork. We can keep the ductwork in the attic and build around it. Similar to how we, did, we talked about building around the furnace in the garage, we could do the same with the ductwork in the attic. We're calling that an attic coffin and we'll go into more detail. Or we can do what we sometimes refer to as a modified plenum truss or what is sometimes referred to as the Oregon truss. So there are a lot of different ways to get there.